Hello, this is Clint Halstead and this is uh, Introduction to Microprocessors online course. I'm going to be talking about chapter 14 this time. I'm using the book called Designing Embedded Systems with PIC Microcontrollers. Um, Principles and Applications, second edition with Tim Wilmshurst. <clears throat> Today we're going to be talking about uh, starting to program and introduction to assembler, chapter 4. The goals of this chapter are to um, introduce the essentials of assembler programming, um, introduce the microchip MPLAB, X integrated development environment, environment um, talk, talk about PIC 16 series instruction set and the use of certain instructions. Uh, we'll, and then we're going to talk about um, simulation programming, the MPLAB software simulator, and then how to download a uh, program to the target. <clears throat> okay. So starting the program, there's there's two main aspects of embedded of embedded design. There's the hardware portion of it, um, and then there's a the software portion. <clears throat> With the hardware portion you're going to need to do, eventually you're going to need to do a PCB board design. That means you're going to actually have to make, you know, some physical board uh, that's going to go inside of a, a, a uh, device, like a packaging. You're going to, so you're going to need a PCB board design with a microprocessor chip on it, some LEDs, a, a display, a Wi-Fi module, something, something like that in order to actually have your, your electronics hardware. <clears throat> um, okay, and we'll talk about how we how we get that piece of it. The next thing you're going to need, in addition, it's also a hardware component, is you're going to need the physical programming tools, um, which is going to be mean you're going to need a programmer, you know, something physically to program your chip, um, <clears throat> possibly an emulator or a debugger. Sometimes you need to debug your code. Sometimes you need to step through your code. Um, line by line to see in order to debug because a lot of times the problem uh, you spend half of your time trying to figure out what's wrong with your code and why it's not working so it's really important to be able to, to have some tools to debug that and that that means you're going to have to have some hardware in order to do that also you're going to need some software obviously you need some software that's going to be able to allow you to write the code um, we're going to start off writing assembly language code and then later on uh, we'll be using C. So for the 16 parts we're going to be using assembly. Um, you can also use assembly for the 18 parts but um, when, you go to, when you go to C, the C language, uh, the 18 F parts have been uh, targeted for the C language and they have a lot of utilities and tools. And the instruction set is really optimized for C as well. For the, uh, or the 18 F parts are optimized for C. They have the, the right number of instructions to do that. Also, you have not only you have to know how to write the software, so you, so the software part of writing the code is really the knowledge of knowing the um, uh, knowing the instructions and knowing the C, you know, knowing the format of the assembly, knowing the format of, of C. Not only do you have to know something about the language, <clears throat> but uh, you need to have the tools, the software tools. So you're going to need to have a, a software that's going to be able to assemble the code. We'll talk a little bit more about that. It's going to translate it from the assembler language to uh, the machine language. Uh, you're going to need to compile it, to be able to simulate it sometimes. Um, after, typically after you write the code, you know, the simplest thing to do is simulate. The simulator, you don't need any hardware uh, other than your computer, of course, uh, to run it. But the simulator, you don't really need to have um, programming tools, a PCB board, any of this stuff. So that's why having a simulator is nice, because you really don't need to have any hardware at all. Okay, so even if you don't have any sort of hardware, you can always just do the simulator. But the simulator is limited to, you know, sometimes 
you need that hardware feedback or interrupts or something in your system to really get the feedback that you need. <clears throat> and then you also um, you need software tools for your emulator. So you got you got a hardware emulator. You're going to need some software for that. Also, uh, you have a debugger. You have some hardware like the Pit Kit 3. Um, <clears throat> it's going to allow you to do some debugging. Well, you also need the software part of that as well, and that's going to be the MP Lab X. <clears throat> is where we're going to get that, which is free. That's a good thing. <clears throat> Most of these tools are free um, for the 8-bit devices. <clears throat> so you can get assembly and C for the 8-bit devices for free. Now if you go up to the, uh, the higher bit parts, then you're going to have to pay. So that's, that's kind of the way microchip does it right now, currently. <clears throat> Okay, so we talked a little bit about uh, the two main aspects of hardware and software. First off, we're going to talk about hardware during this lesson. <clears throat> so I looked most of this stuff information up on Newark, uh, newark.com. You can look up that information. Um, <clears throat> these are the tools that's most common today for doing a PCB board level design. You can use Altium Designer. Uh, they have an SE version which was 1995. They also have some, probably some cheaper versions and some more expensive versions, but this is the one I wanted to compare. I tried to find more of the moderate level version for most of these. Otherwise, you'll be paying, you know, three or four thousand dollars, maybe five thousand. For the Mentor Graphics, um, Altium is the name of the com company, so the first name here is always the company, and then the second name is the actual tool. So Altium is the company, the designer is the name of the, the software. <clears throat> Mentor Graphics, they make uh, three tools. They make Expedition, of course they make a lot of tools, but for PCB design, uh, they make Expedition, Pads, and Board Station. Um, <clears throat> and you'll find those for about um, 890 to, nine, to 1995. I noticed the 1995 is very common on Newark, so um, I, th I guess they're all trying to compete uh, for the same price target. <clears throat> and then a lot of them also have this lower price, price target as well, which is be a low end, then you have like a mid end, then you'd have a high end, which would be even more expensive. They also have PCB123, which is a free tool that you can get um, <clears throat> online, but you have to use their board house. So they, uh, all these other tools, you can use whatever board house you want. and. Uh, a board house is a place where you can actually purchase, um, you can send off your, your Gerber files, your design files, send them off to the board house, and um, they will actually design your board for you and send it back. So you may, may to pay two or three hundred dollars, maybe four hundred bucks, to get a couple of boards that have been designed. Uh, maybe a four layer board or a two layer board, something like that. Um, <clears throat> PCB123 will give you the free software if you, uh, but you're stuck with their board house. The rest of these tools that you have to pay for, um, or the Eagle Cat is free, but in these other versions you can actually create Gerber files and you can send it to whatever board house you want. But the PCB123, you're kind of stuck with uh, one board house, but it is free. So it, it, it's something that will get you up and running. I personally don't like the PCB123 too much. I played around with it a little bit. I didn't really like it that much. Um, but, you know, maybe if you play around with it, you'll like it. Um, Cadence, uh, OrCAD, um, or of course, OrCAD came from the, the MicroSim uh, software. Cadence bought MicroSim. And um, you can get the SE version from Newer for uh, $19.95. And also they have Allegro as another tool. So these are, Cadence is the uh, name of the company, OrCAD is the software tool, and then they have a separate one called Allegro, which would be, uh, I think, more expensive. I, I didn't really check that price. Um, you could check that price as well. And then they have National Instruments, NI, uh, www.ni.com, I believe. They have a, a multi-SIM simulator, and they also have an ultiboard uh, PCB design tool the full version of that is 2001-19, and then they have a, uh, a pro version for 3149. They also have the UltiBoard uh, multi-sim 
suite that you can get for students um, that just does a very small, you know, basic level simulation and board design. It, it's really limited on components and things, but you can get that for 40 bucks for students. Um, and of course, most of these tools have a, a free evaluation version, which really limits your size and everything. A lot of these tools, they limit it so much that you really can't do anything useful. Except when we get down to the Eagle software. Um, Eagle gives you a nice version that's free um, that you can actually do something with. It, you know, you get a you can do a four a four by three design. It gives you all the, the features of the tool. So they don't limit you on any of the features. They allow you to do auto routing, um, two layer boards, um, all the, the tool features are enabled. They just limit you on the size of the board. And they don't limit you on components or anything like that, or libraries. Um, Eagle CAD, so this is by CADsoft, and it's called Eagle CAD. Um, you can get a professional version for 820 bucks. I believe that's the uh, student edition or education if, if it's a nonprofit, uh, but it's a professional version of nonprofit. And then their um, profit, for profit version is, is more expensive, maybe $1,000. I can't really remember. But um, <clears throat> anyway, Eagle CAD is what I use. Um, it's best for, uh, it, a lot of hobbyists use it. Um, it's probably, for example, if you go look up uh, the Arduino's website, they have the entire Arduino board on there uh, in Eagle CAD. So you can download that. So, And you'll find that to be true for, for most open source uh, boards and things like that you'll find mostly they use people use Eagle CAD just because they're really the most friendly when it comes to um, giving you a tool that you can actually use and uh, if you ever decide to upgrade you know of course just putting in the product key and not having to pay that much more they also have a, a hobbyist version they have all different kinds of versions so um, <clears throat> they'll give you a, a hobbyist version where you can do much more than two layers. Can't remember exactly what it is. Uh, for a reasonable price, you know, something that uh, a hobbyist could afford. <clears throat> okay, so continuing on with hardware tools, there's th uh, three types of hardware tools. Um, there's the programmers, there's the debuggers, and then there's the emulators. Now we're talking about um, <clears throat> We're talking about uh, hardware PCB board design. Now we're talking about hardware for the programming tools. Okay. So the three types of hardware tools are the programmers, debuggers, and emulators. What is a programmer? A programmer allows you to get your C code or your assembly language code into the uh, the uh, flash of the PIC microprocessor or microcontroller. So it gets gets your code um, into the chip. Okay, so it has some um, six or about six pins, data clock, you know, uh, master clear, VCC, uh, v, VDD, VSS, I mean, so it has power ground basically, uh, and then the clock and the reset, and then the data and the clock. Also, you have a debugger. A debugger will allow you to um, <clears throat> connect to your chip and allow you to step through the code while it's in your hardware system. So maybe you have a chip here um, with the pins and it's in your hardware and you connect a PIC kit, for example. So you have a PIC kit which is something you can buy from microchip has a USB on it so you have your computer here this is your PC and you know this is your PC box I guess this is your screen so you have a USB this is your keyboard okay so you just connect uh, your, you have the MP Lab X software on your PC. You connect your USB from your PC to your PIC Kit 3, which is some hardware. 
Uh, your, the Pig Kid 3 is actually a programmer and a debugger. So that's the great thing about it. It's both a programmer and a debugger. So it can program the code into your chip and allow you to single step through your, your code. And, and then there's this other thing called the emulator. And an emulator, um, we'll talk a little bit about that, those later. So those are the three main types. We'll get into more details of each one later. So some tools, like I said, are multifunctional, like the Pit Kit 2, the Pit Kit 3, um, will be programmers and debuggers. <clears throat> so how do you determine the level of hardware support? What that means, what that statement means is, you know, what, how do you tell whether your chip, the chip that you're using and the hardware you have, whether you can do programming, debugging, or emulating? Well, the best way is to look on the very first page of the data sheet to determine what level of hardware support do you have, hardware tool support. <clears throat> so you must look on the data sheet to determine what level of uh, hardware tools you can, can be used. Most parts, well pretty much all parts, have in-circuit serial programming. And this is designated by the acronym ICSP. Now that's where you're going to look on the data sheet. Most data sheets will say, um, I copied and pasted this from the PIC16F84 data sheet, it says right on the front page, in-circuit serial programming, ICSP, via two pins, okay? That means you can program it without having to have a special external programmer. Because back in the old days, you had to have a special programmer. Nowadays, you don't need that. And again, to do that, you just need a PIC Kit 2 or PIC Kit 3, basically. PIC Kit 3 is more up to date. <coughs> so, here's what a PIC Kit 2 looks like. Here's what a PIC Kit 3 looks like. You can grab these things for 80 bucks. Um, I don't really know the exact price. Somewhere around that price range. Probably, probably you can get it for cheaper, maybe uh, a little bit cheaper than that. But um, sometimes you can get these embedded in other kits too. So you, instead of just buying the pit kit too, you could probably buy a uh, a uh, entire solution for uh, development, and they throw in the the pit kit three, as you can see here. They always throw in the software for free in the uh, the hardware if, if you buy a little emulator kit or buy a little uh, developer's kit. So this is the PIC kit 2 and 3. They, they do programming and debugging depending on the chip. Now you have to have uh, the PIC 16 chips we'll talk about later. Uh, most of them don't have in-circuit debugging. They, they all have, pro most of them, most all of them have in-circuit programming which is nice. Now in the old days you had to use a serial port, you had this pick kits, pick start plus, and you had to put your chip in here, um, and had a zero insertion force header, and then pull this little lever down, and then you could program your chip. But this is these are out of date today. <clears throat> so how do you determine your debug support? Now we talked about programming support. We're, we're hitting each one of these. We've got programming, now we're going to talk about debugger support. <clears throat> so how do you determine debug support? Well, for the larger pin packages, uh, more than 14 pins, in-circuit debug is uh, available on the 18 parts. Uh, I don't know about the 16. I don't, I don't think a lot of the 16 do, but you can, you can just check on the data sheet. Now, I, showed it, I copied and pasted this off of the PIC18F2XX data sheet. It says right on the front page, in-circuit debug via two pins. It also says in-circuit serial programming. So this chip has in-circuit programming and in-circuit debug available with two chips. Now all you, all you need is a PIC Kit 3 um, or PIC Kit 2, depending. PIC Kit 3 is, is more up-to-date. You have more features with the PIC Kit 3. <clears throat> of course, what does a PIC Kit 3 look like? We already showed what they look like. Um, so this is it and this is it. So this will allow you to do both programming and debug. <clears throat> what is an emulator? Well an emulator, emulate means to mimic or imitate. So <clears throat> emulate means you're basically going to not be, let's say you have a, a certain chip like the PIC, the PIC 16 F 84 A does not have in circuit debug. So what if you want to debug the, your chip? Let's say that you're having a problem. You want to step through the code where you don't have debug capabilities. Well, 
That means you can't you can't use this chip, but you can use something to emulate this chip or mimic that chip. So if you have your chip here, you want to emulate this chip. Well, basically what it comes down to is you buy this big box that's kind of expensive, <laughs> and it's called an emulator, and it has has maybe a USB port here. It's a big box, has some electronics in it, and it has a, a, a ribbon cable here. And then it has a board with another chip on it. It's basically the same chip, but it has more pins on it, and it's designed to have in-circuit debug capabilities. And then you'll have little pins on here that you plug into a board, and those pins line up with these pins. So that these pins line up, so you can insert it into your hardware in place of a chip. So it emulates or pretends like it is the chip, but it's actually not. So that's what emulators are. So really, emulators just a, is a form of debugging. But it's on chips, the, the, uh, the older versions of the chips, the 16 chips that didn't have the in-circuit debug. <clears throat> now why do they do that? Well, in-circuit debug takes a certain amount of silicon. So you may have in-circuit debug here, takes a certain amount of silicon. Now for big chips, let's say if you have a, a big chip here and in-circuit debug, well, the, the silicon you need to do that may be very small compared to a big chip. But if you have a small chip, like maybe a 16F84, then your in-circuit debug silicon is going to take up a very large proportion of your actual full chip. So whereas this may be an 18 chip, this one down here may be a 16, so that's why the 16 don't, don't sometimes they don't have the debug part. Also, it has to do with pin count. So sometimes you don't want to to use those uh, four to six pins to uh, you know to take up uh, pins on your chip. So that's kind of what it comes down to. And that's what basically what all this information here on the screen says that you can you can read on your own. So headers, uh, it can save you some money. Well, I don't know about that, save you money. Really, you have to pay more money because these things are expensive. But I guess that's the way they market, save money. But you save money on the chips if you're going into full production. You save money on the chips. So people selling bukus of these would save money, but developers and educators and hobbyists, they don't save money. <laughs> they, they have to spend more money. So that's, that's pretty much the way it goes. <clears throat> Only certain devices um, need these emulators and, and these these headers. Um, and microchip lists the list what headers you must be ordered. You can read this on your own time. And they even have this little website you can go to to determine what sort of hardware you need. Best suggestion for these days is if 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 you really it really is just to to choose a part that has in circuit debug. <laughs> We're going to learn on we're going to learn a lot on these 16F84 chips, but um, you can't debug on these chips. So we're going to pretty quickly in the course we're going to jump up to the 18F2XX because that's going to give us in-circuit debug, and it's not that much more expensive. Plus you get all of the you get extended uh, instruction set. So really you want you really want to go with the 18F, but for learning you want to start off with the 16F. Why? Because the data sheet for the 16F is a lot smaller, and uh, you don't want to go through two or three hundred pages of information. Do you? You'd rather go through 80 pages and learn something that's actually, you know, you could actually wrap your brain around. That's why we start with the 16F84, just for uh, purely educational purposes. <clears throat> All right, so we talked about this. Now this is what it, a little bit better picture. This is what the MP Lab Ice. Uh, so for a 16F84A, you would need to buy the MP Lab Ice 2000, and you need to buy a header, or you need to upgrade to the PIC 18F242XX or 242. Really, it's 242 is what we're going to be using. But um, you know, if you really, really wanted to use the 18, the 16F84, and you really wanted to spend all the money on this hardware than you could, but uh, most of this is just for legacy information uh, for what people used to do, but uh, it, there may be a situation where you need to do this. Okay, so pretty much the way it works, I don't want to spend too much time talking about this because really uh, uh, 
we're not going to do this in this course, but let's say you have the uh, 16F84A 14 pin device. You, you know, um, it does not have in circuit debug. So, what they do is they create a device silicon and they basically add the silicon here, but then they go ahead and they add the in circuit debug on this chip, and it's, it's a new chip, and I guess they call it a header device. And it has more pins. Now you can do in-circuit debug. You have to create an entire new chip. And they put it here on this, what they call a header, which you have to pay money for. And then you also have this other module you have to pay money for. And now this connects to your computer, your PC. And now you can do debug on a chip uh, like the 16F84A. That's pretty much how it works. The header board has uh, some pins off of it that look like this. And then you just plug that into your board in, in place of your chip. So you either plug your chip here or you plug the header with emulator. And either one, it acts, uh, acts the same way. So I actually did this in school. When I, was, uh, when I was going to school, I used the emulator and it was very helpful for what I was using in the situation that I'm in that I was in at the time. Very, very helpful. I, I could not have, I mean really cuts, cuts your development time way down. Um, if I n did not have that at the time, I would have spent many, 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 many more weeks or months developing because you don't always, I was in a system where I had interrupts and timers and I actually had real hardware and uh, battery charger type thing going on and I really need to have, to have that feedback. I was doing a current sensing on a board with the analog to digital converter, so I really had to have something where I could debug in system. Here's their development tool selector that you can use uh, if you go to this, this link and you put in the name of the chip, uh, the 16F84A, hit enter, it'll tell you uh, what emulator you need and what header you need as well. So they make it pretty easy. Also on the data sheet for the chip, this is the, the data sheet for the 16F84A. Um, it will also tell you on there 16F84XX. It tells you what type of uh, MP lab it, the environment you need, what all the things it will do. Uh, it uses the ICE emulator. Uh, doesn't use the EPIC. Uh, it uses ICD. Let's see here. ICD and circuit debugger. Pick start. So it really shows you all the tools that you can use for that particular part. So that's the end of the hardware lecture. Um, next we're going to be talking about software tools and programming. Thanks.